everyone. Today it's Shakespeare. Ever wondered why in West Side Story, Tony and Maria kiss on a balcony? Or why in High School Musical, Sharpay is killed in a duel? Shakespeare's iconic play, Romeo and Juliet, is a romance classic still being copied by Hollywood, especially when he aged Juliet down to 13. And as a bonus, if you play this episode for your spouse, it counts as a Valentine's gift. <laughs> and this is The Book Pile. I'm Kellen Erskine. I'm a comic, a father, and as a father who just read this in its entirety for the first time, I was actually less concerned about the romanticized take on impulsive teenage decisions and more troubled by the amount of jokes about male genitalia. Holy cow. <laughs> I had no idea. Is Mercutio from a Judd Apatow film? <laughs> Super dead. <laughs> and I'm David Vance. If I were on the front line of Alexander the Great's phalanx formation, I sure wouldn't want to stand next to Shakespeare. <laughs> Kellen, did your connection cut out? I, I didn't hear the strong laugh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, if you want to leave us a valentine, you can uh, rate and review us. <laughs> that's, that's also what I do with my valentines. <laughs> Halbut, now they're just doing it on purpose. Halbut says, this is my absolute favorite podcast that isn't a financial podcast. Come on, man. <laughs> it's like they do it on purpose. <laughs> I'm sure at this point they are because the amount of reviews we now have that say, it's my favorite podcast other than this other thing. <laughs> other than the most boring sounding podcast. <laughs> <laughs> They also say, I enjoy listening to it on my daily walks, although I can't believe Hufflepuff gets criticized so much. Really? <laughs> you can't believe it, Halbutt? Hufflepuff, the none of the above of houses. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Halbottom. <laughs> we also have a fun announcement this week. We are now releasing our episodes on YouTube, just the audio. Part of the reason is we want you to be able to comment on specific episodes and add any of your own jokes. You can say what you thought of the book. You can talk to other people who listen to the podcast. So this is our first one. We'd love if you go to YouTube and search for The Book Pile, Romeo and Juliet, or you can just click the link in this description and leave a comment if you like it. And by the way, if people enjoy having them on YouTube, we will eventually release all of them or at least the ones we're not actively ashamed of. <laughs> All right, so I love this book. At the beginning of COVID, I got really into Shakespeare. I think probably something about the plague, but I, I love his <laughs> writing because it's so epic, but it's still intimate, meaning, you know, you have like the large scale things like duels and battles and betrayals, but you also have all the personal stuff in the romance and the guilt and the family drama. But Kellen, what did you think? So admittedly, I haven't read much Shakespeare other than Hamlet, Macbeth, and Cats. And while this isn't my favorite story, he is just the most incredible writer. It's like yeah. Ray Bradbury in a way, where often for me the story becomes secondary and I'm just there for the beautiful ride. Mm. I know that we're both going to make fun of the ridiculous ages of Romeo and Juliet, but I literally just pretend in my head that they're older <laughs> to make it all better because I just can't deny how great the writing is. It's sort of like how to enjoy the Les Miserables film adaptation. You have to pretend that Russell Crowe doesn't suck at music. <laughs> Finally, our next two books are The Willpower Instinct and A Roast of Transformers, the novel. <laughs> All right, and without further ado, here are four lessons that we took from the tragedy that could have easily been avoided. Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> or if you're referring to the Boz Learman movie, Romeo plus Juliet. <laughs> equals nothing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Lesson one, get to know each other. <laughs> Here's a quote I like from the play. Someone is criticizing Romeo's crush, saying she's not that great. And Romeo says, one fairer than my love, the all-seeing sun ne'er saw her match since first the world begun. And it's very sweet, but he's talking about Rosalind. <laughs> And once you see that and then see how he talks to Juliet, you're like, oh, he's just a teenage boy. <laughs> right. Homeboy calls Rosalind the best woman in history and then marries another girl the next day. 
So for any teenagers out in the dating field, maybe take it slow, <laughs> get to know each other, ask questions like, what's your favorite book? Do you have pets? If your parents force you to marry someone else, is there anything I should know about how you would handle that? <laughs> Romeo being a teenager explains so much because when he's rambling about how in love with her he is, I'm just like, tell me the name of any of her friends. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, kids, just go a little slower than these two. I know some people who got married before they've even seen the other person angry. Isn't that wild? Oh, yeah. That's why I make sure Ummy sees me angry every day. <laughs> Yeah, there are some questions that definitely didn't come up, like, hey, whose family's house do you think we'll visit for Christmas? Or what do you usually do on Wednesdays? <laughs> I mean, I have had a lengthy and still unsettled debate on circumcision. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say unlengthy? <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> See, these are just the things you don't get into when you're married on day one and dead on day three. <laughs> <laughs> and again, like I said, so much of the the lines about love are unparalleled. Oh, yeah, they're incredible. <laughs> but it, it is such an emotional tug of war in my mind because it's also hard to read this and not have thoughts like, yeah, but maybe if you guys didn't die... Romeo, you would have found someone else the next day. Like, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Lesson two. It's okay if characters don't talk like real people. So Aaron Sorkin, the writer of movies like A Few Good Men and The Social Network, which could also have been called Way Fewer Good Men. <laughs> I love so much what he has to say about movie snobs who are critical of characters not talking like real people. He says, quote, The properties of people and the properties of characters have almost nothing to do with each other. People don't speak mm. in dialogue. Their lives don't unfold in a series of scenes that form a narrative arc. I think it's such a good point that you also can't just watch an independent film and be like, oh, good, these characters talk like regular people. And their lives are passing by in three distinct acts. <laughs> I think if Shakespeare worried about making his characters sound like real people, we would have never heard of Shakespeare. Oh, sure. That's the point, right? That he wrote stuff that was better than anything actual real people had ever said. <laughs> Like, if Romeo was a person who could talk, like, the dialogue in the play, just off the top of his head, he would be the smartest 16-year-old in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually am okay with that teenager getting married. <laughs> <laughs> but even Shakespeare wasn't like, well, I need to be genuine as to what a real 16-year-old boy would say if he had a crush. <laughs> he was just like, nah, I'm just going to have him say what I would say as the greatest poet in history. <laughs> Maybe my favorite line of Romeo's is when Juliet asks him how he got into the courtyard over the tall orchard walls, and his response is, With love's light wings did I o'er perch these walls, for stony limits cannot hold love out. Wow. There's a reason we're still talking about Shakespeare 400 years later, because 16-year-old me would have answered Juliet with something like, Yeah, pretty crazy, huh? I'm pretty good at climbing stuff. <laughs> uh, I mean, I mean, the stony limits of my feelings. You get the sense that if they had lived, Romeo would have been able to talk his way out of a lot of consequences of his later actions. <laughs> this lipstick on my collar, tis but the kiss of Cupid. <laughs> <laughs> Juliet, too, uh, shares an equal amount of these amazing lines. Maybe my favorite from hers is, Give me my Romeo, and when he shall die, take him and cut him out in little stars, and he will make the face of heaven so fine that all the world will be in love with night. And I'm pausing for a second so we can all enjoy that before I ruin it by saying that this is now what I'm requesting to be done with my remains. <laughs> I even have a little bag of star-shaped cookie cutters to make it easier. <laughs> Yeah, I was, I was going to say it's really romantic till you actually do it to his corpse. <laughs> like, oh, I thought this would be cuter. <laughs> so then do we just like throw these? How do we get them? <laughs> Chuck his flesh at the sky. 
<laughs> Romeo, where art thou? Well, he's kind of all over the place. <laughs> all right, lesson three. Knowing psychology makes you better at your job. I think a big part of why Shakespeare endures is he watched human nature so closely. You can tell he was so interested in psychology and sociology and politics and dressing up like a man to flirt with your crush and history, all the universal <laughs> things. So I compiled some of my favorite Shakespeare quotes on human nature. First one, for beauty is a witch. You know when you let someone get away with anything because they're hot? <laughs> I think as a college student, if a beautiful woman stabbed me, I'd probably just call her fiery. <laughs> I have a friend who guys on dates will tell me such a good person. And he's like, you know nothing about me. You're just attracted to me. <laughs> Next one. When I said I would die a bachelor, I did not think I would live till I were married. <laughs> That's from the character Benedict and also the character George Clooney. <laughs> Next, the fool does think he's wise, but the wise man knows himself to be a fool. Mm. Sometimes I think politics is screwed because the world is so complicated that the only ones dumb enough to run for office are the ones who think this is simple. <laughs> <laughs> okay, rapid fire. These violent delights have violent ends. Men are April when they woo, but December when they wed. And the devil can cite scripture for his purpose. <laughs> Quick peek into who I am. You can tell that you don't read a lot of Shakespeare when you come across a passage of these violent delights and think, oh, that's from Westworld. <laughs> Lesson four, Shakespeare is misunderstood. What I read is that it can be hard to understand Shakespeare, but I realize now that it sounds like I'm apologizing for him, <laughs> like, like he got canceled, which I'm surprised he hasn't yet, with lines from Romeo like, Oh, sweet Julia, thy beauty hath made me effeminate, and in my temper softened valor's steel, which translated means, Juliet, I used to be brave, but you've made me weak like a woman. <laughs> greatest charmer of all time anyway in a shakespeare class i took in college there was this guy who'd sit next to me and he wouldn't take notes like not even during movie clips or if we were reading during class and i asked him about it one time and he was like i just get it <laughs> <laughs> i was like do you really get it though, Justin? <laughs> oh, should you be teaching? <laughs> like Shakespeare <laughs> invents hundreds of words, but you just already know what they mean straight out of his head. <laughs> it's so insane. And he didn't do well in class, like because after that I couldn't not look at his exam results. <laughs> but just what a crazy like you'll know that personality of that person who just they can never admit to not knowing a thing. <laughs> for me, I, I'm able to get into these stories a lot more when I have some help. So for Romeo and Juliet, I bought a book from a series called No Fear Shakespeare, where they have line-by-line -line modern English translations of the script on, on every opposite page. Oh, interesting. And I didn't need it for every page, but I also couldn't just go full Justin. Like, sometimes... <laughs> It was helpful for just a single word. Sometimes I need it for an entire paragraph. I just got more out of this. So, for example, if you're not a Shakespearean scholar, but you think you totally get him, let me know what you think these lines possibly mean. No sooner in, but every man betake him to his legs. Which means the minute we get in, let's all start dancing. Which was a relief to me because betake him <laughs> to his legs sounds like amputation was going to be involved. <laughs> I was like, this ball is really going off the rails. <laughs> Those lyrics actually fit a great dance song perfectly. <laughs> like, betake him to his legs, legs, <laughs> legs, betake him to his legs. <laughs> and something, uh, yeah. And then there's like a rap bridge with something about busting a Capulet. So <laughs> here's Romeo talking to Mercutio. That was never with me for anything when thou wast not there for the goose. <laughs> if you don't remember this line, Dave, what do you think it means? I would think it means you never help me with anything unless you're trying to get with a girl. <laughs> what a sexist 
interpretation. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out who the goose is in this situation. But no, he's telling Mercutio that all Mercutio does is joke around. <laughs> oh. <laughs> And I will say to all our listeners out there, if you're an American who already knew that being there for the goose meant joking, then please skip ahead. I didn't didn't realize you knew everything. How about this one? For I had them laid wormwood to my dug. (laughs) You want to tell me what that means, Justin? Oh, rubbing herbs on your breast? (laughs) Well, you're exactly right. Keep that pen unclicked. Here's your A+. (laughs) So this week I spent part of a sunny afternoon reading this at a nice little park with green hills and birds in the trees. And for a minute, as I was heading to a park bench with the book, I had the quick thought of, hey, not only will this be pleasant, but it'll seem like uh, maybe I'm an interesting person to any passersby. And then I sat down... (laughs) pulled out Romeo and Juliet from my bag and realized that the biggest, boldest words on the front and back covers are no fear. (laughs) I was like, you couldn't make the word Shakespeare just a little brighter. (laughs) So then I just didn't hold it up too high when dog walkers came by. So my takeaway here is if you're hesitant to read Shakespeare because it seems daunting, it is. And not just because he actually invented the word daunting. Just get some sort of easy-to-access translation guide in book or online format. I think you'll have a good time. But if you get No Fear Shakespeare, just read it at home. (laughs) I just wondered for anyone who walked by and saw No Fear, if they were like, is is it like a story about a 90s (laughs) t-shirt? Next week, I'm going to the park with Abercrombie and Fitch, Hamlet. (laughs) All right, random facts. Romeo and Juliet feels like someone tried to write a Hallmark movie and then just totally biffed it. (laughs) This Christmas, can two lovers with nothing in common bring together the whole town of Verona? Oh, crap, everyone's murdered. (laughs) He was a hothead who didn't know the meaning of Lut Shoot. He stabbed her cousin. (laughs) That is such an interesting connection, though, because Hallmark is like bigger than ever as far as like romantic movies, especially around the holidays. But it is funny Mm -hmm. that all of those executives and writers just look at ostensibly the greatest love story of all time. And they're like, yeah, we'll probably do the opposite. (laughs) It's shocking how shameless they are in stealing the most famous love story, except the actually gutsy part. (laughs) (laughs) So I think it's crazy that a womanizer is often given the name Romeo. Oh. Hey there, Romeo. But you never hear of a charming woman called, like, she's a real Juliet, you know? (laughs) Like, I realize that there's the word womanizer, but there is no word for manizer. (laughs) It's usually just floozy. (laughs) There are words for it, but none of them are nice. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Men get words like player that are much more complimentary for that kind of thing. Yeah. We're just better at branding. (laughs) (laughs) I'm kidding. I know that all those words come from us. (laughs) At one point, Lady Capulet says, Tybalt, my cousin, oh, my brother's child. That is not how cousins work. (laughs) Oh, yeah. One of the most famous quotes in all literature, parting is such sweet sorrow. We forget that the line before it is when Juliet first says, if you were a little bird, I would kill you by petting you too hard. (laughs) What metaphor is she communicating? (laughs) It sounds like someone flirting real badly. (laughs) That's true. Yeah, that's one of those where you just step on the gas a little too much. Like, man, I would kiss you so much, I would push your head off. (laughs) This one's more an observation. Romeo was pretty lucky that Juliet's closest guardian was so chill about a teenager marrying a murderer. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, at one point, Juliet's nurse even says to her, Romeo's face is a lot better than that Paris guy. (laughs) (laughs) I think a good rule of thumb is if you still have a nurse, you should not also have a husband. (laughs) 
So Juliet is 13, and they talk about how pretty soon she'll be an old maid. So <laughs> does that mean that her mother is 26? <laughs> And her great grandmother is fifty two. Oh my gosh! Like, I want to see this family picture that goes back like nine generations in one take. <laughs> I don't think I've told this story. There was this girl I used to carpool with to junior high, and she ended up getting engaged when she was seventeen, and I was a year younger than her. And she came to our house and was talking to my parents, and I came out. And she's a year older than me. And because she's now an engaged adult, she points at me and turns to my parents and says, now, which one's this? <laughs> oh, no. Here's a fun sentence that I made up. I really did. This isn't a joke. <laughs> a critic is a bandit who dwindles in lackluster loneliness, uncomfortable undressing submerged with countless assassinations. So not only is this just a hilarious G-rated image and <laughs> something I wrote after reading some of our negative comments, but the really fun part about it is that Shakespeare invented all of those words except for is, who, with, and a. Wow. So he invented 1,700 of them. But the way that no he's way. credited in the shallow research that I did is that there are 1,700 words in his plays and poems that appear for the first time ever in written English. That's how they cite it as his huh. inventing them. But he just had to have, right? Unless there were some douchebags around there back then who were like, oh, yeah, I mean, we say those words all the time. We just don't write the <laughs> long ones down. <laughs> But it's also fascinating, yeah, that he may have invented 2,000 words, but also, like, not all of those caught on. Like, <laughs> some of these were used once in a play and never again. So then that's a that's an interesting idea, too, that there are these words in English that have only been used once in history. Oh, and now again by you. <laughs> I assume you're going to read some of these. <laughs> I couldn't even find uh, descriptions for a half of these because they're up to like interpretation of like the words surrounding this new weird word. Like we think <laughs> it means poop. We have no idea. So there's arm gaunt, insisture, which sounds gross, padjock, wappened. <laughs> I read some of these to my boys and they said that that sounds like a stick that you hit people with. And then disponge. Guess what disponge means? To remove a sponge? Close. It's a verb for when it's pouring rain as if a giant sponge is being squeezed on you. Oh, that's fun. Oh, I'm sad that didn't catch on. <laughs> Kellen, have you ever seen the Twitter account New New York Times? No. They tweet every time a word is used in the New York Times that has never been used in the New York Times before. Hmm. So here are some recent ones. Stray boy. Goofballism. <laughs> Wet babaloo bop. <laughs> Wunk. And ball sack. <laughs> At first I was going to say, how has that word never been used before? <laughs> Or after, you know, JFK was assassinated, someone had to have been like, I really want to <laughs> really want to kick the shooter in the balls. <laughs> <laughs> we have that on record. Can I use that quote? Yes. <laughs> no, sorry. He said that was just on background. <laughs> oh, oh, man. I, I really hope the ball sack and goofball is and we're using the same sentence. <laughs> You know that this presents a thrilling new opportunity for <laughs> goofball sackism. <laughs> and with all these, I want to be aware that I know there are a million other words and phrases that he came up with that you can look up. There are plenty of fun lists to research. He came up with things like knock, knock, who's there and fight fire with fire and mm. Netflix and chill. Finally, I just wanted to tell a quick story. When I was Romeo's age, I went to see a friend at his high school's adaptation of Romeo and Juliet that was supposed to be noir, and it sounds like a cool idea. But you know that quote, 
you have to know rules to break them. I think that clearly any high school production of anything, they're just breaking rules. Uh (laughs) Like the backgrounds are fun, all black and white, but aside from teenagers just generally not being good at Shakespearean acting, the director also Uh apparently thought that noir just means everyone wears overcoats. (laughs) (laughs) All right, this book could also be called... Instead of 500 Days of Summer, it's Three Days of Juliet, parentheses, and One Day of Rosalind. (laughs) I have, could also be called Romantic for Them, Horrifying for Everyone Else. (laughs) This could also be called West Side Story, Twilight, New Moon, Warm Bodies, Shakespeare in Love, Nomeo and Juliet, and Camp Rock 2, The Final Jam. (laughs) Don't you think that Nomeo and Juliet, there's no way, there's no way <laughs> that that title did not come before the entire rest of the movie. <laughs> I am never going to look up the synopsis. I don't want anyone to ever talk to me about it because I am choosing to believe that Nomeo and Juliet is shot for shot, <laughs> that he stabs himself, that everyone's dead at the end. <laughs> yes. Yes, at the end, the families go in uh, and they just see it's just a mess of broken ceramics. <laughs> All right, to recap, our favorite lessons from Romeo and Juliet. One, get to know each other. Two, it's okay if characters don't talk like real people. Three, knowing psychology makes you better at your job. Four, Shakespeare's misunderstood. And five, I know that we made fun of Shakespeare a lot in this, but we were just being there for the goose. They take him to his legs, legs, legs. They take him to his legs, legs, legs. They take him to his legs, legs, legs. They take him to his legs, legs, legs.